Actung Actung. Uh, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, James Holland, out and about on the ground back in Malta. Um, it is a place that just keeps drawing me back, I have to say, although never a sadness to be here. I love coming back to this island and, of course, for me, its wartime past is never far away, although, of course, Malta has this incredibly rich history that goes beyond just the the, the few comparatively short years of the Second World War. But this one I'm kind of focusing on the 10th submarine flotilla and particularly one submarine, HMS Urge. Um, and it's amazing because I'm, I'm, I'm on the Valletta side of Marsa Machette Harbour. I'm looking over at Manuel Island and at the Lazaretto. And the Lazaretto was, it was a quarantine hospital originally that's what it's originally built for um stop people with leprosy um or the plague originally or any other kind of nasty disease when you arrived in malta you had to go and check into the lazaretto um a bit like doing your kind of sort of two weeks in a hotel during the height of the covid pan pandemic and the view i'm looking at right now um i've got a photograph actually of the Lazaretto taken during the war with a Unity class, a U-class British submarine moored alongside it. Could even be an HMS Upholder, to be perfectly honest. It's got the sort of bulbous bow that Upholder had. And I'm standing in the same spot that that photograph was taken from. Sort of always boats out on the water, kind of harbour cruises and what have you. Um, and actually, Manuel Island is beautiful. It's beautiful. The Lazaretto is a beautiful building. Um, extends in different many different parts but where the um, submariners were based was it's like a series of kind of sort of arch arch sort of windows like a sort of veranda like a loggia, I suppose looking straight out onto Marcel Machette harbour and I was lucky enough to get into there 10 years ago it's completely derelict um, you know wouldn't get past the health and safety executive back in the UK and I think it won't even get past the EU health and safety executive now no one's allowed in there but I was lucky enough to get in there um, some years ago and it was a haunting place uh, it was originally originally the plans were to build um, a whole series of underground shelters for the submarines um, the princely sum of 340,000 pounds it was going to cost the UK government to build these but of course you know it's wartime it's uh, it's 1940 eyes are turned to other other areas and other priorities and it just never happened uh, and but Churchill once well there was a huge debate about what to do with Malta I mean do you just abandon it this I'm talking about 1940 now do you just abandon it or do you do you actually reinforce it um, arguments for abandoning are it's not a priority case it's probably going to be overrun anyway because it's so under defended as it is I mean basically got no planes on it it's got you know the Mediterranean fleet has already been moved out was the base of the Mediterranean fleet um, but that's been moved to um, to Alexandria so that's not going to happen um, so the, the naval base isn't here anymore in 1939-1940 it's 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 been under supported underdeveloped so is it better to cut your losses and just abandon it there and then the other school of thought is, no, absolutely you should reinforce it because it's a key piece of real estate. It's absolutely bang in the, in the middle of the Mediterranean, kind of, you know, Gibraltar's 870 miles to the west, um, Alexandria's 970 miles to the, to the east. It's sort of bang in the middle. It's just south, 60 miles south of Sicily. So strategically very well placed and absolutely you should, you should defend it. Um, and it's probably no surprise that even though it's 1940 when these decisions are being made, because, of course, um, Italy declares war on the 10th of June, um, perhaps there's no surprise that Churchill was all for reinforcing it. And it was actually it was Churchill who said, gosh, beef it up quickly and get a submarine flotilla out there. Make it the base, you know, make this an offensive base. Don't 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 be kind of penned in and, and um, think of it just as a place to defend. Let's use it as an operational offensive base on which we can attack access shipping and make life very uncomfortable for the Italians. And, you know, obviously, in my humble opinion, he was absolutely bang on. Um, and getting a submarine flotilla out here was an absolute priority. And the 10th submarine flotilla was created specially to go to Malta. And Lieutenant Commander, hastily promoted to Commander George Simpson, was, was the man. Um, he was always known as Shrimp. Um, and Shrimp Simpson was sent out to be in Malta at the beginning of December and to recruit his flotilla. 
and so a whole load of Unity class submarines, British submarines, they weren't U-boats because there's only a German, were sent out to the Mediterranean. The thing about the Unity class is it's a really small one and it was, it was designed as a training submarine only. So a crew of 32. But it was thought that in the Mediterranean, um, where you can actually see quite clearly under the water from, from, from height, um, the great diving capabilities of the Unity class um, were very much to its advantage and would work really well in the Mediterranean. So although it was designed as a training vessel, as a training boat, it actually was seen to be perfect for what was required for offensive operations in the, in the Mediterranean. So all these Unity class boats were hastily built um, and sent out, of which Urge was one, and uh, Lieutenant Commander Tomkinson. Um, and Upholder, which we've talked about on the, um, on the pod a number of times before, was another under Lieutenant Commander David Wanklin. So they were all heading out here, arriving kind of, you know, variously uh, in January. And in fact, HMS Upholder arrived on the 10th of January 1941 mid, uh, um, immediately um, docked not at Manawan Island, but uh, on the other side of Valletta um, in the three cities in Frenchman's Creek on the 10th of January 1941, which is precisely the same day that the aircraft carrier, um, having been attacked out at sea, limped into port um, and was the cause of what became known as the illustrious Blitz on the 16th, 18th, 19th of um, January 1941, where you know, I think a, a hundred aircraft came over on the 16th, of which 70 were bombers, 80 on the 18th, a similar number on the 19th, but they never managed to hit it. And the illustrious managed to um, sail away on, um, on the 23rd of January 1941 40, and managed to make Alexandria three days later, right under the noses of, of, of Flieger Corps 10, which had arrived on Sicily uh, at the very end of December 1941. Uh, 1940 rather. So uh, that was quite some sort of arrival for Upholder, as you can imagine, but like the illustrious, they weren't hit either. It's very difficult for those Stukas. It was, Frenchman's Creek is sort of surrounded by the Corridano Heights and sort of higher ground, and it was quite difficult for the, for the Stukas to get in properly close. Um, so it kept missing. Unfortunately, it kept missing the Upholder as well. But the base was chosen by a chap called Pop Giddings. Now, Pop Giddings, until the 10th Flotilla turned up, was in charge of, uh, of the Royal Navy's submarines on Malta. And he was a part-time wine rep and part-time um, submarine administrator. Um, incredible kind of indication of the, of, the, of the kind of sort of amateurish half, not really kind of firing on full cylinders effort to, that started Malta's war. Um, in the summer of 1940. But he did, you know, he was pretty good, give credit where credit's due, and he, he managed to get all sorts of supplies on there, knowing it was going to be, going to be tough um, to supply the submariners, but understanding the importance that after being on patrol for two weeks or whatever, they'd come back and they'd need feeding. So he had a pig sty of pigs, which he kept at the Lazaretto, and all sorts of things, and um, various dry stores. Um, and it ended up being a very, a very sort of, happy home really for the 10th flotilla once they made their base there um, and certainly by the spring of 1941 they're seriously starting to to hurt Axis shipping and one of them one of my favorite stories is that of the sinking of the Conte Rosso um, on the 24th of May 1941 by HMS Upholder and I remember talking to Tubby Crawford who was the uh, second in command under Wanklin of the Upholder it was kind of dusk uh, and they'd seen they'd already sunk two ships on that particular patrol and they were heading back there as Dick had broken down. Um, so they couldn't sort of pick up um, any enemy shipping from the Asdic, nor could they protect themselves from enemy shipping from the Asdic. Um, and it was quite a choppy sea, but they saw these four troop ships surrounded by an escort of five destroyers. And it was kind of, do we go for it or don't we? But Wanklin, imperturbable as ever, said, no, 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 we, we, we should go for it and we should get him really, really close, as close as we possibly can. They actually got so close, they were inside the destroyer screen and basically hit this thing, the Conti Rosso, a, a sort of point blank range effectively. I mean, basically almost on the surface, just a periscope showing. But of course, the alert was sounded as soon as they saw the white trail of the torpedo going through, heading towards this troop ship, hit amidships, huge explosion started to list almost immediately and of course what Upholder had to do was dive very quickly and thank goodness for that unity class quick diving capability but even so between 9 45 p.m 
and five past ten, those 20 minutes, absolutely terrifying minutes, in which they were depth charged 37 times. I mean, can you imagine it? And I remember talking to Tubby about this, saying, gosh, you know, were you scared? Well, you know, there was one guy who was so terrified that he was he tried to escape up the conning tower and they had to kind of forcibly restrain him. But, you know, Tubby certainly was made of pretty tough stuff and he sort of chuckled a bit and said, well, you know, was a little bit hairy, I suppose. <laughs> Classic understatement. Um, but he pointed out that, that, you know, a depth charge had to hit on three different planes, the vertical, the horizontal and forward and backward motion. So he always reckoned uh, that thinking of it like that gave him the confidence that they could get out of a scrape. But certainly those were 20 minutes of a number of near misses. And actually the last ones were were very, very close shaves. The whole boat rocking from side to side and bits of corking coming off and what have you. Um, they finally emerged at 11 p.m. to find just, you know, the smell of oil on the surface and the sea that was now empty and the Conti Rosso they'd heard that sinking, this sort of terrible, screeching, grinding sound of, you know, broken metal and disappearing under the waves 1300 lives lost but you know tragedy though that was for the Italians that's a 1300 Italian troops that were never going to be going into action against the British and Commonwealth troops in North Africa but amazing story we're going to take a quick break we'll be back shortly see you in a moment Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. And it's, you know, it's fair to say that, you know, HMS Urge sort of, you know, was second only to HMS Upholder in what it managed to achieve in terms of Axis shipping sunk, including an attack on the battleship, the Vittorio Veneto, the Giovanni della Bandanera, an Italian cruiser which was sunk. So, you know, some pretty big scalps. And Tomkinson got a DSO and bar and bar and was, you know, sort of, you know, suggested on numerous occasions that he was one of those people, a bit like Paddy Main, who ought to have been put forward for a Victoria Cross. But on the morning of the 27th, you know, in April, it became absolutely intolerable. Bomb, you know, um, um, Malta was being absolutely pounded. It was the height of the, uh, of the Luftwaffe's blitz at Field Marshal Kesselring's um, command. And it was just impossible for, for the 10th, submarine flotilla to remain in Malta at their Manuel Island base for any longer and so one by one they were going off and in the case of Upholder that was going out it was going to do one last patrol and then head on home for England it was due for its, its return but um, Urge was due to be heading straight to Alexandria and on the morning of the 27th it, it left um, it left Manuel Island for the last time um, and when it didn't show up on in Alexandria, it was missing, presumed sunk, but but what had happened to it, no one knew. Um, so it's always kind of poignant to sit here and, and, and look at Manuel Island. And I have to say, when I was there and I was walking am amongst its empty rooms, you know, it was it was pretty poignant. I have to say, you could very easily imagine the submariners, you know, I don't know, in sort of the middle of 1941, coming back from a patrol where it was comparatively safe for them to do so, and sunning themselves in chairs and underneath those arches, looking out over the kind of beautiful, twinkly sea of Marsemachette Harbour, looking back at the huge great bastions, the, the late 16th century, early 17th century bastions of, of Valletta, named after John, John de la Follette, the great, um, the Grand Master of the Knights of St. John who withstood the siege of Suleiman the Magnificent. And you could picture them there, you know, having their kind of pink gins or what have you. And it's very poignant to see it here. There's something always rather kind of wistful, isn't there, about a, a building that's gone to rack and ruin a little bit. The scaffolding outside the front, I don't know whether that's because they are finally going to turn it into something or whether that's just to stop it from falling down. But ever since I've been coming to to Malta, everyone always says, oh yes, there's great plans for Manuel Island, there's great plans for the Lazaretto, oh the submarine base is going to be done up. But it never is, but then on the other hand, the amount of building work that goes on in Malta, I wouldn't be surprised if next time I'm here to find it all looking spick and span and open again as some beautiful kind of five-star hotel. And I can tell you what, if that is the case, I'm definitely going to treat myself. 
Well, I've now come to Fort St. Elmo, uh, which is interesting because this was where the first bombs fell on Malta after the Italians declared war on the 10th of June. So the following day, the 11th of June, Italian bombers came over and Fort St. Elmo, which was, you know, one of the great bastions that held out against Suleiman the Magnificent's fleet back in the second half of the 16th century. It was manned by members of the Maltese artillery and it got bombed and I think 20 people were killed, something like that. Um, later the set of um, Midnight Express, that awful prison drama from the 1970s, classic of course but just sort of such grim watching. But I'm now coming up to a memorial that looks out over the entrance to Grand Harbour, there's the breakwaters. It's the same breakwaters that the Ohio came through on the 15th of August 1942, effectively breaking the siege in many ways. The kind of the all-important oil tanker, former Texaco oil tanker, that came through the last ship to arrive from Operation Pedestal. Just five out of the 14 ships actually made it into Grand Harbour. And as I look out over Grand Harbour now, there's a merchant ship actually coming out and a patrol vessel just off the, beyond the breakwaters. Over the other side on the three cities, sort of Fort Ricasoli and also the Malta Film Studios where they're currently making a film about Napoleon. Um, and such a sort of, it's amazing to stand here because it is such a, a place of incredible history throughout time, you know, over the centuries. But of course, you know, for me, it's the war and its association that really kind of hits home. There's a couple of people below me on the rock sunbathing, um, a sort of indication of what a kind of peaceful place Malta is these days. But amazing to be here. And just behind me is the memorial that was opened just this year on the 27th of April, 80 years to the day after it was lost at sea, having left, um, having left the Manuel Island on its way to Alexandria, it hit a mine. And here's a memorial that was unveiled just the other day to HMS Urge. And it's fantastic to see, it really, really is. Uh, and I was very sorry, I missed it actually. I was invited by um, Francis Dickinson, who was um, Lieutenant Commander Tompkinson's a grandson. He's a friend of mine and he invited me over, but it was the same week that I was doing that trip to Dresden. So I missed it. I don't know if you can hear that ship coming out of the harbour now, but you know, as ever, the beautiful wine dark sea, the azure blue skies overhead, the kind of the yellow limestone rock of Malta, it's... Uh, it's fabulous to be here. It also reminds me of being here in 2005 when I was just on the uh, lower Barracas, just around the corner by the Siege Bell, which was built in 1992 for the 50th anniversary of the, um, of the awarding of the George Cross on the 15th of April, 1942. I remember being here in 2005 when the Merlins over Malta came and it was a Spitfire, a hurricane. And you could sort of hear this faint hum and then suddenly there was this huge roar as the Spitfire Mark V and the Hurricane together kind of hurtled around the corner and sped down Grand Harbour and uh, my friend Clive Denny was flying the Hurricane and um, it was actually so low he was below the level of of the three cities of Senglaire and Vittorioza at the time he was flying down it was an amazing thing I remember the hairs on the back of my neck standing up but the reason I'm here at Fort St. Elmo is, is partly because of the moral, but partly because I'm just about to go and meet um, a very, very special guy, Professor um, Timmy Cambine, who's, um, who's an absolute legend. Uh, Navy archaeo or maritime archaeologist, I should say, um, has dived on so many wrecks and aircraft wrecks that he's found over here. He's attached to the university of, he's a professor at the University of Malta. Um, but he is the guy who led the team that found HMS Urge, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to meeting him. Tune in next week for James's fascinating chat with maritime archaeologist Timmy Gambin as he describes the discovery of HMS Urge.